morning, everyone. Today, Friday, May 8th, 2020. I'm Ben Dryden. You're watching Dryden Wire Live. Wisconsin's 63rd District Representative and Assembly Speaker Robin Voss is my very special guest today. Very excited to be chatting with Robin. Also, thank you to all of our guests this week, Wisconsin 12th District Senator and 7th Congressional District Candidate Tom Tiffany. Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald was on Tuesday. I always love talking with uh, Fitzy. Attorney, business owner, and former Wisconsin Representative Adam Jarko was our guest on Wednesday. And Embrace's very own Brittany Olson was Diane's guest on yesterday's Diane's Kitchen. No, it's not a cooking show. Great week of guests. Great week of guests. If you miss any of them, you can always watch them on our YouTube channel, or on our website, redmore.com, or of course, just on our video tab in on Facebook. But let's get to today's guest. Please welcome in for the first time on our show, Wisconsin 63rd Disc Representative Assembly Speaker, Mr. Robin Voss. Robin, good morning. Good morning, Ben. Hey, thanks for having me on. I have heard so much about your show and the ability for people in Northwest Wisconsin to get independent news. Thank you. Uh, and I consider it an honor to be with you. Oh, I was just, dang it. That was what I was going to say to you. It was an <laughs> honor. You took it. <laughs> So, um, wow, a lot going on down in Madison, and I can't wait to kind of get into some of those things with you. But what we always like to do the first time we have someone on is get to know the person. So you're Speaker Voss, but my, I, I guess I haven't actually put in an open records request for your birth certificate. Uh, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it won't say your first name is Speaker. Thank it's, God. Right. So uh, let's get to know Robin just before we get into all the other stuff. So. Tell us about you. Where were you born? Where were you raised? What's your story? Sure. Born and raised in Burlington. My family came here uh, in the mid-1800s. Uh, some distant relatives still have the same dairy farm that they started, uh, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, my mom and dad uh, also raised in Burlington. They're still alive. They are um, both uh, pretty successful. My dad had a small business, so I really got to understand the work ethic through my parents who, and my grandparents, frankly, who also own businesses. Uh, and they always had an interest in politics. My dad was on our city council for 25 years uh, when I was a young man, I got involved in the Republican Party. Uh, my sixth grade teacher was the woman who kind of took me along to all the events. Now, of course, Ben, that would be like freaky. But back then, she'd pick me up. She'd take me to the events. She'd bring me home. My parents said thank you. It wasn't a big deal. Um, but really, she's the reason that I got involved in the party. Uh, in college, went to UW-Whitewater, got a degree in political science, thought I'd be a stockbroker. The math was way too hard, so I decided I'm going to go into college. <laughs> instead, and here I am, right? Um, so mm. I decided uh, to work at the Capitol for a little while. I did that for about five years, and then I got the itch to buy my own company. So uh, in 1996, I bought a small food packaging company with two employees, and now I am super blessed after getting elected to the Assembly in 2004 and watching our business grow. I have awesome employees, uh, and we have about 70 people who work for me now. Oh, so wow. that is my Monday, Friday job, where I try to be there at least every morning. And then my Tuesday to Thursday job, and usually Friday and Monday afternoons, uh, is my political job. So it sure keeps me busy, but that's because I am super blessed, too, that I am married to the most awesome woman in the world. Her name is Michelle. Uh, she um, understands politics. She was elected for a little while, did a great job, but then uh, took a step back to be with her family. So I, I certainly am blessed in the world that I live in, but, you know, it's, it's challenging. I, I, when I started in 2004, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have uh, anywhere near the Internet. Most of my calls came in uh, either by a fax or by a written letter or a phone call. Now it's mostly Facebook messages and people who send an email. Sure. I do something a little different where I try to call back all the constituents who live in my district, not the people who live in all of Wisconsin, but the people who live in my district to have a personal conversation with them. And I have found that most of the time, even the hardest uh, left wing person who's angry in their email has a harder time doing that when you talk over the phone. So sure. I just wish in the world we were in today, we could have more conversations yeah. like you and I are having, as opposed to just a bunch of fiery emails and, and snarky Facebook posts. We've had a lot of guests on and there are a lot of politicians where we've had that conversation regarding something about this, this combination between social media and you being a politician, as soon as you say you are a representative or anything in a politician, between those two, you're just no longer a human being. Yeah, and right. they forget that you're just a person, too. Uh, and, and, and even like when we publish press releases, you can't, it's very difficult to have a conversation or give a message in a text message or in an email. 
there's there's more to it. You're missing the tone. You're missing the understanding. And I've always strongly encouraged people, if you have a problem with a representative or what they're saying, and especially if they're one of your representatives, call them. But so many people just yeah. won't call them. Why do you think that? It. Is it because they just don't really want an answer? Well, you know what the difference is, though? And, and, and it's funny because whenever I go and speak to groups when they visit the Capitol, I always tell them when they go out and lobby. So, you know, Ben comes to Madison and wants to talk about uh, snowmobiling, whatever it is. Sure. If you meet with a politician and they don't agree with you, they will often say phrases like, well, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll have to consider that. They don't have the courage to look in the eye and say, you know what, I don't agree with you and here's why, because they're sometimes pandering too much, right? So I try to be as direct as I possibly can. You know, I don't always have the answer. We may not always agree, but I think people deserve and want an answer to their question. So I think a lot of times people get discouraged because they never get a real answer. They feel like they get the runaround. And I think that discourages people from acting. So for the people who are watching right now, I promise you, it doesn't matter what party this Democrat or Republican, if you contact your legislator, they are going to get back to you. Mm. Uh, if for some reason they don't, they don't deserve to be there. That's their job. They got to answer the hard questions. Yeah. They got to, you know, be probed and understood and have to communicate as well as they can. And that's your job to listen. Well, I like what you said. It almost sounds like you're saying be genuine. Uh, yeah. It's okay that you know, this is where I feel. And this is why I feel this. This is my opinion. And this is, uh, again, why I have that opinion. Uh, but that's okay. Right. And we can agree to disagree. Uh, but, but I have actually spoken with a few uh, represent or actually just legislators in general, where it seems like there isn't that answer, where it's, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if they're just scared, or maybe it's an election year, right? I don't know. And maybe that's a smart play is to not really, but I think it's perfectly fine to have an opinion. I think everyone just wants to know, where do you stand on this and why? That's right. all. And if you can't explain yourself, you probably don't deserve to have the job, frankly. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's not that hard. Yeah. So you said that you have this business that you started and then mm -hmm. now it's gone well and you're also working there. So, uh, uh, here's a little insight for our viewers. I really don't prepare for any of these. Maybe I should. Uh, but I do start at about quarter to eight. And then we always have our guest on, as you just were, a little about 10 minutes before. So we can do a sound check and stuff. So I get about half an hour to look th some things up. So it looks like as of now, and tell me if this is right, I got on ball Ballotpedia. Um, you are co-chair of Employment Relations Committee uh, on the Joint Legislative Council Committee, co-chair Legislative Organization Committee, Chair of Assembly Organization Committee, Chair of Employment Relations Committee, Vice Chair of Rules Committee, Wisconsin State Assembly. <laughs> so, do you just not have hobbies? <laughs> you know, I used to have more hobbies than I do now, Ben, frankly. So, it's funny because I always say that politics used to be my hobby. You know, I've been involved in the Republican Party for a long time in my life, and I have a lot of friends through the Republican Party. Then it became my job, and now... It, it's not as much fun as it used to be, only from the standpoint that when it's a hobby, you can choose to do it whenever you want to. But when you do it as a job, it's a job, right? And yeah. I still love it. It's just different. So um, my job as speaker is unique. So everybody in the state gets a chance to vote for one of 99 legislators. Mm -hmm. Each of us represent approximately 58,000 people. Some have one county, some have a part of a county, some have multiple counties. Um, and once again, Democrat, Republican. So in general, um, I have found that every person who runs for the legislature is interesting and uh, smart in their own way, right? I don't agree with them on a lot of things, but by and large, they are really good, decent people. And, and for the people who watch your show regularly, thank you, uh, because you have sent us excellent representatives. Romaine Quinn, Rob Staffschult, Gay Magnifici, uh, Jimmy Boy Edming. I mean, I can go through a whole long list, Adam Jarko and Eric Severson and Shannon Zimmerman, a, a lot of really good, decent people who do an excellent job in our caucus advocating for your region of the state because they have a background that's unique, right? Mm -hmm. Some are business owners. Some people come from a um, you know, legal background. Some people uh, literally have been a teacher or a doctor or whatever it would be. And that's what makes our legislature so special. So the first day of the session, the legislature elects one person to be the presiding officer. So my job is in essence to be the chief operating officer of the state assembly. So uh, I'm no one's boss. I, I certainly can't tell any legislator what to do. So I have to convince them and hopefully through the ability of us working together, have us all be on the same page. Sure. So that's why the job of speaker is really challenging because you're taking, in my case, 63 Republican uh, type A personalities who all have their own opinions and their own districts and trying to coalesce them around a single vision on whatever topic it would be, funding schools or reducing taxes or any of the yeah. different priorities that we have. And then you have to worry about the Democrats who spend most of their time, and this is their job, figuring out how to gum up the works 
um, because they want to be in charge, right? They want to get Democrats elected over Republicans. So, you know, in general, that's our biggest challenge is figuring out ways to work together while still realizing we're in different parties, but also trying to take every part of the state, every different background and meld them into a common vision what we need for Wisconsin. Uh, so you, I think you started that in, speaking of what, 2013-ish as a speaker? Correct. So. At the end of this term, I will actually be the longest serving speaker in Wisconsin history. Uh, my friend and colleague, Tom Loftus, who uh, was a Democrat speaker in the early or the early 90s, late 80s, was there for eight years. But if lucky enough, I'm reelected and I get to stay a speaker, I'll be the longest speaker in state's history. It's funny because wow. there was actually a study done by the National Speakers Association. And Ben, do you know the single best dead end job in politics in the entire United States? No. It is becoming the speaker. Because being speaker means you are a pincushion for everybody, right? Anybody who doesn't like something, they blame it on the speaker. Anybody who thinks it's great gives it the uh, credit to their own legislator. Sure. And I, I signed up for that job. So I know this is going to be the last elected job I will ever have. I'm not running for Congress. I gave that chance up when Brian Style was elected. He's doing an awesome job. Uh, I'm not running for governor. Uh, I like being the speaker, and I'm hoping to stay at that for a while. But it's because you know you really have to make difficult choices and it's not always the easiest to be able to corral yeah. those people. To that's, that's it. Really blows my mind that you're saying that that you may be if you're reelected the longest tenured speaker. And just starting in 2013, mm -hmm. my dad just retired about a year and a half ago as a sheriff in Washburn County, and he was a sheriff for 28 years. And that still <laughs> wasn't the longest tenured sheriff. I mean, he was like probably yeah. one of the top two or three, uh, I assume. Uh, but. That's not a very long well, shelf life. Like, so why in the world is it? Is it because uh, people don't uh, the people who put the person in place or elect the person for the speaker lose faith in the person, or is it because the speaker is going, man, this job sucks? <laughs> well, mostly it's the job. Some people think the job sucks. I'm still lucky. To, I like it. Mm. But I will say, if you look backwards, the previous speaker was, um, you know, a gentleman, Jeff Fitzgerald, ran for U.S. Senate. The guy before him lost his seat. The guy before him, uh, you know, uh, lost the majority. The guy before him ran for Congress and, and ran for governor. And so a lot of people use the job as a stepping stone to run for something else. And that is certainly their right. Um, I'm kind of looking and saying that, so I'm also president of this group called the National Conference of State Legislators. It's the national organization for all legislators in the country. I'm the first person from Wisconsin. It's bipartisan, uh, it alternates between Democrat and Republican. Uh, and one of the things that I do during our new speaker training is I talk about the fact that when you get chosen to be the speaker, you have two very legitimate choices as to how you want to lead. One is you're going to do this job the very best you can, regardless of how it affects you personally, because that's what you choose to do. The other is you use it and you do the best job you can, knowing that you're going to use the position to run for something else. That is also super legitimate and lots of people do it. But making one of those two choices changes how you do the job, right? So if I'm thinking about running for governor, I'm going to probably make different choices than if I'm just thinking about making the legislature the strongest branch it can be and making my members the best possible part of an institution they can sure. be. So I've kind of chosen that option, and I hope it served me well. You had mentioned, excuse me, Romaine Quinn earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. What was that phone call like? Yes, when he knows that he and was. He, yeah. <laughs> Romaine is one of the most decent, honorable people that you could ever uh, meet. I, like I mean, I, he has, I thought he had a bright future. He could have been speaker. He certainly could have been rising in our leadership. But when he called and said that he and his wife got a super awesome opportunity and that he wanted to look at doing something different, you know, to, to, I think it's hard for sometimes people to, as you said, Ben, and it was super on the on spot, that people are politicians second and they are people first, yeah. right? So. They have a wife and they have a family and they have a future and they have a potential career after politics. So when Romaine said he had an awesome opportunity, I, I couldn't do anything but say congratulations. Yeah, so he'll be back. He, he, I, I hope he I will hope, be. I, he'll be back. Not a smart. <laughs> all right. So let's get let's fast forward now to obviously all the things going down in Madison, which, by the way, I uh, uh, I was told a couple years ago. That's uh, with, I think it was Romain, I was uh, on the phone with him, that he said he was heading to Madtown. I said, oh, okay. I was asking him about something. A couple weeks later, I was talking to someone else, another legislator, and said, yeah, I just got back from Madtown. I'm thinking, where is this Madtown? It's like some small little city in northeastern Wisconsin. Obviously, I realize now it's Madison. So, wow, there's a lot going on. And you're involved in a lot of this stuff. So, I don't know where you want to start, but we should talk, probably talk about the safer at home. Where do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, let's, let's start with that. I mean... I think for anybody who, 
So I always talk about Corona time, right? A day feels like a week, a week feels like a month, yeah. and a month feels like forever, right? It seems like we've been in this uh, literally Groundhog Day movie uh, mm-hmm. for two months. And I think everybody wants to say, stop. Let's, let's just get back to normal as quick as we can. So when the Safer at Home happened um, in the you know, middle of March, mm-hmm. I think many of us realized there was a real problem. We have a disease. We've got to figure out how to combat it. And frankly, nobody knew. They didn't know exactly how it was transmitted. They didn't know how contagious it was. They didn't know the best uh, way for us to be able to contain that so we didn't have people you know, all across the country um, dying uh, in a way that they could have not had that happen. Right. So I, I certainly give credit to Governor Evers when he started that he did his very best. Um, I, I'm a little disappointed, frankly, that you know other governors across the country chose a different way to interact with the legislature. That um, so, as I said, I'm involved in this NCSL, and we do a leader call on a pretty regular basis. And I was with the Senate president from Massachusetts, and we were kind of going through and talking about how everybody was interacting with their governors, because of course we're the legislative side. And in Massachusetts, they have a Democrat supermajority in their legislature, both houses, and they have a Republican governor, Charlie Baker. And what he did is they began every week, twice a week, uh, where the Senate president, the speaker and the governor in person rotating between their three offices meet and say, how do we fight this virus together? Um, I think that's what if you have ever read Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, A Team of Rivals, that's what President Lincoln did once he won the election. He said, look, we were political rivals before, but now we have a common vision to keep the union united. And I, I wish that Tony Evers had used more of that technique to say, OK, we've had our squabbles in the past. You know, we certainly don't agree on every topic, but we should be united on doing this to be able to have a vision for what it will take to beat the virus. That's not what happened. And it's really unfortunate that um, we had a, exactly one consultation, um, you know, uh, except for the one we had on Monday. So we've now had two. Uh, we had one consultation early on where he said to us, we've got to have the election. The election has to happen. Um, you know, we understand that city councils and county boards, uh, all of those school boards have to be elected. For us, it's a general election. It's not a primary. All the other states that canceled or postponed were primary elections that were, of course, uh, for partisan offices. That's easy to move around because the election's not till November. And we agreed. And then, of course, we know how that ended, where the day before the election, uh, he said, let's cancel it and move it, which, of course, we couldn't do. Um, that was the last time we really had any kind of meaningful consultation in that. That is just disappointing to me. It didn't have to be that way. Yeah. When, so, so yeah. if I can back up just a second here, course, yeah. uh, just a little insight, I guess, right? Uh, how did that? When did you first find out, and how did you find out about the safer at home and what Evers is doing? How does that work internally? Is it like a, a memo that goes out, an email? Does do offices call the other offices? How does that work? No. What What happened for us is. Governor Evers called from a number that said, you know, restricted or whatever, so I didn't pick it up. Uh, He left me a voicemail after on literally on Sunday, we do it. We were doing an everyday staff conference call Mm -hmm. where all the chiefs of staff would be on the same phone call and kind of exchange information. So we at least had an understanding of what they were doing. On Sunday, he said we are absolutely not his office said we are not doing a safer at home order. And on Monday morning. I got a phone call uh, from a restricted number that I didn't recognize, basically with him saying, I'm going to do a restri- I'm going to do a safer at home order. So no input, no understanding of what it was other than literally 24 hours saying we're not doing it, 24 hours saying we're doing it. And then, of course, you know how the whole cluster happened where we're going to do it on St. Patty's Day. Well, it's going to be at eight o'clock. It's going to be at five o'clock. And then the whole thing went around. So it, 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 I, I try to once again put myself in his shoes that I know it wasn't easy. Yeah. I am certain that there were a ton of pieces of pressure on him. Mm. But communication is what politicians have to do as best as they can. And I feel like that's one of the areas that they've really lacked on. They haven't utilized the 99 legislators as an echo chamber mm. to be able to say, here's why we're doing it. Here's our vision. Work with us to get this sure. done. Uh, so I think there's been a lot of misunderstandings. And frankly, that's why we are here we are today. So for the 60 days that Governor Evers had this emergency power, Uh, For a lot of the early part of the order, we more or less sat back and said, look, we understand we've got to fight this virus. Do what you have to do. Mm. You know, you have 60 days to kind of show us what it is, get the data points, and then we'll move forward. Of course, you know, as that 30 days went forward, more and more pressure came on us to say, hey, get rid of the order. But we tried to say, let's be responsible because we don't have all the details yet. And then when Governor Evers, you know, literally weeks beforehand said, I'm going to artificially extend this, knowing he didn't have the power to do it by having a, a, you know, a a bureaucrat who's unelected, unaccountable to anybody but him, make a decision that they're going to shut the whole state down, determine what's essential and what's not essential, literally rip people's livelihoods from them. 
that 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 is not allowed to be done in a system where you have a republic. So that's why we didn't want to sue. I would have preferred this team of rivals approach, but the options before us were really limited. We have to have the courts make sure that they're the ones respecting people's liberty and their property mm -hmm. and the ability for the legislature to be a co-equal branch at the table because we represent different parts of the state, different viewpoints, and frankly, having more ideas around the table makes the decision stronger, better, and more legitimate. Not opposite. Yeah. I think most people, and we've had this discussion with a lot of our guests, everyone, Republican or Democrat, the, when the Safer Home came out, uh, it was okay. Like, there, I, I don't think there were a lot of people who were upset. About, I mean, uh, certainly there's going to be some issues there, but uh, whether you're a business owner or something, but we're all, okay, you, you get a free pass, right? I don't care uh, yep. what party you belong to or if you just don't even care about politics. It's I totally get it. But it now seems to have turned to the reopening, and mm -hmm. that's where now it's starting to get, obviously, more political. Um, going back to a little insight, if you would, uh, you had met with him, and I don't know who's in that room uh, I think you had sent out a press release. We published it. What was that conversation like? Is is it one of those things where you're friends with uh, Democrats uh, behind the scenes? You're talking, you're laughing, sure. and then you go into the you know onto the floor, and then you just rip each other because that's just how <laughs> politics work. When you're behind, yeah. having those the, those closed door meetings and conversations, just what's the tone there? Is, is it an, a genuine openness? <laughs> well, here's what That's I would not start. a good yeah. sign. <laughs> I know. Exactly. Here's what I would start, right? So having a conversation on the telephone is oh, right. different than yes. a conversation over Zoom, right? A conversation over Zoom yeah. is different than ha or Skype is different than having a conversation in person. So I, I think being in the same room allows you to have the best interactions where you can see people's body language, you can make sure they're paying attention, you know, all the things that are just human nature that we all do innately. Um we have never had an in-person meeting since this whole thing started. So let's start with that. Um, we have never had a Zoom meeting where we could at least see, you know, like, okay, what's your tone? Are you listening? Are you getting notes handed to you? Sure. Any of those kind of things. Um, so the call that we had on Monday was a phone call. Uh, it had the five legislative leaders, Senator Fitzgerald, um, now Senator Bewley, mm -hmm. myself, and Gordon Hintz, okay, along with Governor Evers, his chief of staff, our chiefs of staff, you know, kind of all on the phone. And our whole goal of that call, because if you remember, we sent him a letter two weeks ago. We sent him a letter the week before or the week after saying, please, let's have conversations. We want to talk about reopening. Mm -hmm. And we kind of got rebuffed um, to his credit. He's finally set one up and we did it on Monday. Um, they gave us 45 minutes. Um, you know, I, I wished we had already met again on Thursday or Friday. But when we asked to say at the end of the discussion, OK, we've talked about regional reopenings. He doesn't really like that. We've talked about doing more retail openings. He said he was open to it. Uh, and we tried to make the case that it makes no sense at all that you can go and get keys made or a flower, uh, flowers for your mom for Mother's Day at Walmart, but you can't go to the local flower shop. You can't go to the key shop. You know, you can't go to the local restaurant, but you can buy a hot dog inside Walmart. I mean, the whole thing is goofy. Um, and, and he didn't necessarily accept that, but he said he would think about it. So at the end of our conversation, we said, well, what's the next step? Can we can we talk again? How about if we do something later this week? And he said, well, how about if we meet after the lawsuit? And I said, well, we can do that, but assuming we're going to win the lawsuit or if we lose the lawsuit, we should still be working together. Uh, and I, we kind of have been waiting, and I think we'll meet again after the lawsuit. So I think that's a bad sign, in my opinion, because, you know, my hope was that we bring the five of us together. We begin to literally talk about how do we get this place reopened? I mean, we've got to have mm. the state working again. Mm. Where you are, there are very few cases. Right. Where I live in Racine County, there are more. But there are still parts and ways that we can do it safely to guarantee that people don't lose their livelihood. I mean, 500,000 people are out of work, Ben, and yeah. that number is getting worse. I mean, so so I guess I try to be an optimist. You know, um, we did a, a, a TV town hall last night in Milwaukee uh, where they asked Governor Evers to be on with me. Uh, and he said no. He wanted to do it by himself where he was just one interview. Uh, so I went on with Gordon Hintz. Good guy. Had no problem with that. But I feel like nobody's really asking Governor Evers the hard questions, right? I mean, they had this interview yesterday on WTMJ Radio in Milwaukee, and the first question they asked the guy is, well, now that you're stuck at home, what kind of movies are you watching? I mean, <laughs> That's like a question I, I would ask, right? <laughs> yeah, I would, you know, but I just feel like we need to have more of a robust conversation to say yeah, people are losing their minds because they are either afraid at home 
or they are fearful that they're losing their livelihood. We've got to give them hope. And that only happens by leaders working together and talking. Mm -hmm. And and it just seems like it's like pulling teeth. I don't get why it's so hard. uh, So obviously that's the biggest thing a lot of people are talking about is what's the at this point, should we be re-looking at what makes an essential business and what isn't an essential business and potentially a way for some of these businesses to uh, uh, still open, do something, be safe, have their own plan? I don't know who they'd have to get it approved from, but that I know that has been discussed. A lot of people are looking for that. And then, of course, the regional uh, approach and the regional opening. Those are two things that I'm hearing the most from, uh, I'm not saying Democrats or Republicans, I mean just People in town, people. business owners, they, right. and a lot of these people, they're not like my brother. He owns a, a, a 24-7 fitness gyms, the body shop in, in in two cities here. And it's – obviously, this is killing his business, but there's a lot of people who, especially the elderly, that relied on that equipment for their actual health. And it's like, you know, we sure. will have extra staff on, and we can have kind of like when we first went into this, of the, the 10, 10 people maximum keep six feet apart, and we'll have a person there monitoring all this. But it just seems like a lot of these businesses aren't getting the option to do that. Do you think at any point here that will be uh, discussed? And do you think that will ever happen where we're going to be re-looking, be re-looking at this essential versus not essential and maybe just getting rid of the terminology? Yeah. First of all, let's start with the idea that I hate the idea of saying somebody is an essential or a non-essential business because that is BS. Every single business is essential to somebody, oh, right? True. So let's not even let's not even accept that as a reality. So I think every single business can reopen safely. Um, I think that we have to first of all trust. There is not a business owner that I know that wants to risk their customers' health, their own health, their employees' health, or frankly their financial health if they somehow get an outbreak and it's tied back to their gym, their flower shop, mm-hmm. their you know their hardware store. So everybody wants to be safe. Uh, I think we just got to use some common sense. You know, if people want to wear a mask, fine. I have no problem with that. That is your right. If people want to ask their employees to wear a mask, I I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think if they want to do temperature testing or do some kind of a little interview when you walk in to make sure you're healthy, every business has the right to do that. But I think that having a one-size-fits-all, top-down, bureaucrat-driven approach is why we're in the pickle that we are. I mean, I trust your brother. I know that he is going to want to get people back in there, uh, especially considering the fact that if they come, he's got to keep them safe or they're not going to come back. Right. So I, I just don't get the, the reality yeah. that people feel like government is the only one that wants to keep people safe. I, I think we can do it both. So I look at what other states have done. We see Governor Evers, you know, is all over the map. You know, it's like, first of all, we were going to do this with these eight other governors. Now we see Michigan, Pennsylvania, Illinois. Uh, you know, all these other states are doing regional reopenings and they're doing it now. We see in the South, you can go to restaurants in most of the places in the South with more than just a uh, takeout, right? They can do it safely. I think it's Texas or South Carolina. They're phasing it in where one week it's outdoor seating, then it's 25%, 50, 75. And by the end of the month, it's going to be 100% somewhat back to normal. I think we can do those things. Mm-hmm. I, I don't understand what the reticence is considering the idea that for the most part, Most of Wisconsin doesn't even have the seriousness of the outbreaks. They have some, and we've got to be cautious. But we can't cripple our economy and make people literally stand in bread lines at the end of this crisis because we're going to have no resources left because nobody's paying taxes and nobody's working. You said when you met with him or had that phone call, didn't seem very open to the regional approach. And obviously that there's a lot of, I'm sure, (laughs) private conversation there, but uh, things you can't (laughs) share. But can you share any kind of insight as to or feeling that you got as to why? Was there any kind of a reason given as to why this, uh, that's not a good idea? Well, let me, let me repeat what Janet Bewley said, which was shocking to me, considering that she represents Northwestern Wisconsin. She said it would not be fair if some parts of the state were able to open and other parts could not open. Well, first of all, fighting the virus isn't fair. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is not about fairness and equity. Uh, This is about doing the very best we can to keep as many people safe as we are able, but also use our brains. I mean, if we have major outbreaks, I think it's 60 percent of the the identified cases since the beginning have been in Milwaukee or Brown County. Mm. We have 30, 30 counties where they have single digit cases with most of the people where they've already recovered. So explain to me why somebody in Superior or Rice Lake, uh, you know, or wherever it would be, can't safely reopen because we've got to hold them hostage because somebody in Milwaukee can't have the ability to get it done in the same way. It makes no sense. So that's the bigger argument that they're giving us is this fairness concept 
that it's not fair to everybody. Well, so, you know, so that's it. The fairness that. that's that's the because I know yeah, a lot of people were just waiting. It's perfectly fine. Like we talked before, it's per- you have a strong opinion. Uh, this is what I believe. Fine. Just own it and tell us why. And I think a lot mm-hmm. of people are just waiting for the OK. It's, it's again, radio addresses. Just it's, it's fine. That's what you think. And here. But. Tell us why exactly. Don't kind of uh, move around it a little bit. You should go on your show because if you went on your show, I trust that you would actually ask the harder questions. Because <laughs> I don't ever ask hard questions. Hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you change, the but uh, uh, I'll so ask him. I'll call. I'll, I'll send an email today, and I'll see if he can come on. <laughs> you should. I would. I think that'd be good. Okay. But I mean, the crazy thing is that um, you know, I I understand there are some legitimate concerns, and I don't want to discount those. That you might have people from Milwaukee drive to Door County to go to their cabin, yeah. right? I, I think that's what they don't understand is that's already happening. I talk Yeah, I live here. Trust me. It's already, already happening. <laughs> I mean, so I mean, we're, it's already occurring. So to yeah. use that as kind of some kind of stalking horse that we're going to bring the virus and transmit it all across the state, that is possible. And I think we should minimize the chances. But I think we also need to recognize that we aren't building walls around every county. We're not building walls around every city. We've got to be smart, which is why people wear a mask. They socially distance. They have the ability to use hand sanitizer and wash their hands and try to, you know, minimize your contact if you feel like you're in a vulnerable population. Because here are the, some of the stats that I feel like never get through to the public. In Wisconsin, zero people under 40 have died, right? That is a great statistic. Most of the people who have passed away have been 60 or older, okay? Most of them have had some kind of underlying health condition. So. I have parents in that area. I worry about them every time they go out of the house. There is no doubt that we have to be legitimately worried about that. But it also means that somebody has to continue working to pay the social security and the benefits and all the things that are gonna make sure that they are safe both on a health side, but also financially to be able to live their lives. Uh, And that's what I don't think we sometimes factor in that it's gotta be a balance and it feels like we have the ability to achieve it if we're just willing to sit down and talk together. Well, I know, uh, so we're at 30, uh, just over 30 minutes right now, and I know that you have other things to get to. There's a couple <laughs> follow-up questions here. So the going back to Governor Evers and your conversation and kind of not feeling like you're part of the group, one, is that kind of normal, like when Scott Walker was the governor? Is this just kind of how it goes politically that we – I mean, why would we want to include them? We're just going to do things and tell them what we're doing. So is that normal? And if not, do you think any of this goes back to the lame duck uh, in 2018? And it's kind of not a punishment, certainly, but is that playing a role in any of this? You know, I don't know. I mean, I can't. I don't want to say what their, you know, sure. their psyche is. I'm not going to be a psychologist. But let me let me just say the way it has been in the past, right? So. I stay in touch with all the former Wisconsin speakers on a pretty regular basis, right? I mean, they give me advice and I ask their counsel. Um, and in each of their circumstances, they had regular interactions. So with Governor Governor Walker, let's take that as an example. Every Wednesday, um, with few exceptions, but it was most of the time, uh, Senator Fitzgerald and I met with him for sometimes it was a half an hour, sometimes it was two hours, sometimes it was yucking it up because we were in good time, yeah. sometimes it was yelling at each other because we were disagreeing, right? Sure. But you still got together. And after we met, he would meet with the two Democrat leaders. And sometimes we'd all meet together, but usually we'd meet separately. Um, Since Governor Evers started, we asked for that regular weekly meeting, and he has refused to grant it. And I don't understand why, but I'm not going to beg for a meeting. I mean, it seems like this should just be part of the normal way of operating. So unfortunately, it's been that way for the past 14 months. So when we got to the pandemic, it was just the normal way that he chose to operate, right, which is a very small group of counselors very powerful uh, people who give him advice and either he listens or not. I don't know how that works. Mm. He has very little outreach to anybody. I mean, I'm sure I, I know he hasn't left Madison in eight weeks. Well, if you're only in Madison, only talking to a few people and most of the conversations you have are on the telephone, you are going to get a much different flavor of what's happening in the state than you and I do by simply even just driving our sure. around our community, to go to the grocery store. Mm. Right. It's just different. How's this going to end? Uh, we're going to win the court case, um, which is going to happen hopefully today or Monday. Or you know, I, I keep having people on Facebook saying, "Why is the court taking so mm-hmm. long? What are you going to do to make it go faster?" Well, the normal way they operate is they have arguments, and months later they publish opinions. So that is the normal way a court operates. It's not you know lickety split. They're doing it as fast as I think they can. They want to write a good opinion, and I hope it's going to be on our side. So assuming that we win, 
that does not automatically mean the state of Wisconsin is open. People have this misconception that we sue and we open the state and it goes back to pre-corona. So I think what's going to end up happening is they have to come back to us with a plan, which is called a rule. Uh, we have the right to look at the rule and say we like it, we don't like parts of it, we don't like any of it, and we get to adopt it, reject it, or ask to have it modified. So that process will probably take seven to 10 days after the court ruling, mm -hmm. where I am legitimately asking Governor Evers to sit at the table with us, to do it even on a Zoom call, where we can have a negotiation, figure out something that isn't a Republican plan or a Democrat plan. It's a plan that all of Wisconsin can be united around. So I hope that happens. I hope it gets in place as quickly as we possibly can get an agreement. If for some reason Governor Evers refuses to negotiate with us, you know, we might have to pass a bill that shows what our plan would be and send it to him for his signature. We might have to let the entire order, uh, you know, go until we have that answer. But that is not our goal. Our goal is to have a safe, gradual reopening plan in place. That's what the state of Wisconsin wants. I think that's what the vast majority of people uh, have been doing around the country. And if Texas, Georgia, Illinois, every other state can do it, so can we. It's crazy, man. It is. It's way, it shouldn't be this hard. It really shouldn't I mean, even across be. the border of Minnesota, they're already beginning to do reopening and their plan is much more aggressive than ours. Well, they have the Twin Cities. They have rural areas. I don't understand why if Governor Evers you know, wants to look to others for leadership, there's a lot of other people around the country who are doing it right that we could copy and be able to get our places open a lot quicker and save a whole lot of family business. Well, uh, Adam uh, Jarko, when he was on, had said that he felt that the relationship between uh, Evers and that administration, and I think he was referring to then GOP leadership, probably more specifically you and Fitzgerald, he said it was, he believes it's probably broken beyond repair. And that was a few weeks ago he had said that. I'm having a hard time disagreeing with it right now. So just saying. <laughs> well, but it's the difference, though. In politics, like let's look at Corona time. A day is a week and a week is a month and a month is forever, right? So in political time, you have to be willing to let yesterday go. I mean, if they want to hold some kind of a chip on their shoulder because we rebalance the powers, which we were going to do under Governor Walker anyways, win the lame duck, mm -hmm. they can hold that chip, but they don't have the right to do that. We are elected to work together. So if they call me today, I will put aside my fear and trepidation that they haven't been willing to work with us, and I will sit down in good faith, and I will negotiate to try to find the best answer we can. Well, I tell you what, but, I, I'll send a text to, uh, to Tony and uh, <laughs> tell him to make sure he takes that call. <laughs> well, use your power of persuasion and your listeners. Send an email, write the mm. governor, say, work with us, get this place open. Um, you know, I mean, even though his voicemail is full, call again. Mm. Uh, we got to get things moving. And frankly, the only way it's going to happen is by the power of people. It's not going to be by the power of politicians. I mean, we're doing our part. We're fighting as hard as we can. But it's really got to be people power uh, that make this happen because we can't do it alone. Robin, you're awesome. Thanks so very much for coming on, man. Hey, I appreciate your time, and thanks. Let's do this again. Yeah, no kidding, actually. Well, no, some people say that, but we'll find out if I hear <laughs> back from you uh, in a couple of weeks or not. <laughs> I promise. I promise. All right, thank you. Special thank you to my guest today, Wisconsin 63rd District Representative and Assembly Speaker, Mr. Robin Voss. And thank all of you for watching. We'll see you right back here next week as we continue our daily live chats during the stay-at-home order. So until then, stay safe, keep your social distance, and have a blessed day.